Now I'm just cooking up a, a hamburger without a bun and some potato salt. I was so starving. I'm like, I gotta grab something real quick because I'm stuck here till 7.30 tonight, believe it or not. Wow. With different meetings and then all these other things that come through, yeah. Oh, I'm on a board that's me at 6.30 and now that I have a meeting after this, it's just, no. It's never ending as they say. So I wanna see, I don't see it going live yet. So I'm just gonna check with that. Can you see my screen? What do you see? I can see your screen, but I have two screens going. So I have another one here that where the questions will be running. So yeah. it says the session will start soon. So it's, it's not showing that started. So I'm trying to have both what they see and what you uh, and what you're seeing as well. So anyway, I'll look for you on LinkedIn so we can connect. Yeah, I will connect as well. I just connected with Sandra uh, before as well. So here we go. It's starting to it's going now. Unless it was before. And we, I can see your screen, but I have two screens going. So I have another one here that where the questions will be running. So it says the session will start soon. So it's, it's not showing that started. So I'm trying to have both what they see and what you uh, and what you're seeing as well. So I'll look for you on LinkedIn so we can connect. Yeah, somewhere. I will connect as well. I just connected with Sandra uh, before as well. So here we go. It's starting to it's going now. Unless it was before. And we, I can see your screen, but I have two screens going. So I have another one here that where the questions will be running. So it says the session will start soon. So it's, it's not showing that started. So I'm trying to have both what they see and what you uh, and what you're seeing as well. So I'll look for you on LinkedIn. So we can connect. Yeah, I will connect as well. I just connected with Sandra uh, before as well. So here we go. It's starting to get going now. As it was before. I can see our screen, but I have two screens going. I'm trying to mute this. I'm trying to have both what they can you see. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. Can so I, okay. I don't know what was running there. I we were on like this this never ending. Yeah, loop. I know. It kept going. It's like a movie. So, I've muted on my other screen and maybe that was the problem. So I'm hoping uh, uh, people can uh, see and, and hear. Um, we have uh, almost 40 viewers here now. So we'll, we'll probably get started. Uh, and my apologies for that. There's always uh, some sort of glitch in the technology. So I'd like to welcome everybody um, to this is the second in the, um, the skills and knowledge series. And we are having uh, luckily to have Greg Lane here today. So this is the skills uh, for the information age, a blueprint for tomorrow's workforce. I did want to just begin by letting everyone know we have just under 50 minutes. I think um, Greg's going to try and do uh, 40 minutes in terms of the presentation, 10 minutes Q&A. Um, for the Q&A, you're able to vote. So go in, post your questions, and I'll go through them and, and post them. And then um, everything will be recorded. You'll be sent a link. It is on uh, Cvent for 90 days, and then it goes on to the Digital Transformation YouTube uh, slide. So uh, without further ado, I just would like to uh, introduce uh, Greg. He has over 30 years of leadership experience in the IT field. He did his master's in uh, research studies on customer service and outsourcing. He's worked as in product sales for large firms such as Microsoft, Cisco, and in consulting with both Deloitte and Accenture. His leadership experience includes a lot of uh, volunteer activity with uh, CIPS, ICTC, and uh, ITAC, which is now Tech Nation. He's published on the, the topic of building relationships in a digital world and portals, and is lectured uh, with a, a number of uh, the uh, Gulf of College and University of Ottawa here in Ottawa. And he's an executive resident in the University of Ottawa eHub program and the national CEO of uh, CIPS. And that is the Canadian Association of IT Professionals. So today, um, he is going to give us a, an overview of digital transformation and what are the, um, the IT talent, uh, what do we need, and, and, and really probably digging in deeper. I, Greg was telling me he was in the previous session with Sandra, and uh, he, his work, um, his presentation is going to build on that. So uh, over to you, Greg. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer. It was nice. Appreciate the introduction. And yeah, I've had a lot of jobs. <clears throat> the joke is I couldn't hold one for very long, but so I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are at KIPS. Um, it's a hard C like bruschetta. 
um, why we're engaged. And I'm, I'm gonna apologize in advance. I've taken two or three different decks and tried to put them into one format. So uh, there's probably gonna be some uh, visual glitch glitches, but um, I can apologize for that. I wanna talk about um, some of the challenges we see and how we're dealing with them from a, a professional development perspective, from an individual member or individual uh, practitioner or professional. And then talk maybe a little bit about specifically how we see that's going to change going forward. Anyway, I'll just get into a little bit of background on KIPS. Hopefully, I can advance my slides. So these actually date back to the very start of our society, right? So helping or determining and developing and, and maintaining the integrity of competence of individuals active in the information technology field. So we have a code of ethics that we've adhered to since day one, and we continue to advance that code. Um, the theory and practice of information technology is what we're focused on. And we accredit university programs, we certify individuals, all in that, uh, with that aim. The free interchange of information about the theory and practice of information technology is another thing that we think is important. And I'll talk about that more in the context of community. But more importantly, maybe in this call, is the establishing public awareness of the potential impact of technology and protecting the public and individuals against the misuse of information technology is what we see the role of our society and our members. Protecting the public. I, I listened to the privacy or deputy privacy commissioner speaking this morning, and it's really a challenge. Um, just to be very candid, the bad guys share really well what they're learning about how to uh, to hurt our systems. Um, the good guys aren't doing a good enough job in sharing information about how to prevent the bad guys from doing those kinds of things. And so that's part of our uh, mission and mandate is protect the public by sharing that kind of information across professionals. Just a couple of quick fast, uh, fast facts about us. KIPS was formed in 1958. And back then, as you can probably understand, there wasn't a lot of information technology around. So it was primarily academics. Whoa. Um, and we've evolved since that time. It's a national organization. We have um, provincial members or societies because most labor legislation is managed provincially and we have designations that are governed or covered by uh, provincial legislation from an IT perspective. So I'm the national president and we are uh, an association of associations, if you will. We are an IT community and I'll talk a bit more about that, but we are trying to the extent possible to get all the different players or stakeholders in IT to share information and trust each other. Because um, as I said, the bad guys are doing a pretty good job of that. KIPS is internationally recognized and I'll talk more about that later. We are people, not companies. A lot of the organizations you'll see, um, Technation being the best example probably, are made up of companies. We aren't, we're absolutely individuals. Now, most of us are employed by companies, but that's not where our, our reason for being here is. It's primarily for personal development and maintaining contacts and networking. And we do provide professional certification. We have two designations, one of which is covered by legislation in most provinces in Canada. It's called an ISP. And the other is internationally recognized called an ITCP. So when we talk about certification or those, desi those uh, ISPs and ITCPs, um, there's a few things you need to know. A, a code of ethics is required. God bless these. Um, for individual members who are not certified, you just have to abide by the code of ethics. For a certified member, you have to pass an exam and prove that you understand ethics and the implications of ethics for IT. And you have to also agree to protect the public interest and the privacy of information, avoid conflicts of interest, take responsibility for your work, and contribute. So we require most of our members to attend university classes as guest lecturers or mentors or in many other ways, or comment on legislation or provide insight for us that uh, they may have based on their work. Talked about relationships and building communities. So we have memorandums of understanding. So we're working collaboratively and trying to do joint events with people like CIO Can, the, the CIO Association of Canada Strategic Council, uh, IEEE, the CS part of that, MISA, which is municipal private sector or municipal uh, IT people, and Action TI, which is the Quebec-based um, wing of KIPS, actually. So we also support DPI, which is the Federal Government Association, Tech Nation. We comment on stuff with them and or work with them on different uh, submissions they make to government. 
ICCP, which is a certification program uh, looking at international training and, and certifications, ICTC, the old tech nation. And we're actively working with the government of Saskatchewan on an, an immigration uh, initiative. Internationally, we're a member of IFIP, uh, the International Federation of Information Practitioners, which is a UNESCO body. We support and are set on the board of SOFIA, the Skills Framework for the Information Age. We are the signatories of the SOL Accord, which is a mutual recognition of university computer science degrees across seven countries. And we have relationships with other, we believe, trusted sources of information around um, what's happening. So Beacon, which I understand just folded in the last month or so, Better Ethics and Consumer Outcomes Network. And then Ashley Cassavan, who left the federal government as a director in Treasury Board to work with an organization called Responsible AI Institute setting up what she calls a do tank to help people understand how to build ethical AI code. Talked a bit about international, the International Federation we've talked a bit about. Um, I, the certifying, we've talked about that too, but we also have mutual recognition. So Australian Computer Society, the, um, the International Engineering Group and New Zealand Computer Society, we recognize their designations and they recognize ours. So if you're carrying a Canadian designation, as an example, you don't have to pass immigration requirements for Australia. If you hold an ISP or an ITCP, you can emigrate to Australia as a proven professional. And there's other countries where that's permitted and allowed as well. This is the way that I describe what the problem we're trying to fix in Canada is. And we've had a couple of speakers already talking about skills challenges in, in the country. And, and I could spend a long time trying to explain it all, but I absolutely believe it's a systemic problem. So it starts at very early ages where, as you can see from this diagram, girls and Indigenous, a lot of underrepresented IT groups just don't see themselves as a part of the supply line, if you will, for skills and talents into uh, the IT community. And it goes on to post-secondary institutions. And even in secondary institutions, there's just not enough uh, training, sensitivity, education, pick any word you want to help people think about the options and alternatives available to work in IT. And as we've talked about already today, IT is not just a discrete industry, it's a part of every business. So if you want to be in fashion, healthcare, anything, having a good grounding in IT is going to help you there. So we're working on programs with different organizations and institutions to improve the number of people in underrepresented groups trying to join. And I could spend time talking about what we're doing at K to 12 with girls, what we're doing with indigenous, but I don't have time today. If somebody wants to follow up and, and has some thoughts, love to hear about them. So we're working on the traditional stream to try and increase the flow. We're also looking outside the traditional kind of educational path to say, what about non IT students? How do we get them to come over? How do we attract people from the foreign countries to work here in Canada? And what do we do for people that may be in other industries that would like to get into IT? Because what this diagram is intended to communicate is this role here, the senior specialist, we don't have enough of them in Canada. There's, there's what's called a significant demand supply issue at the top end of the, the talented IT pool. And what I'd like to say, and I know is a fact, is it's not a Canadian problem. It's a global problem. There is not enough IT talent anywhere. And there's nothing in the supply chain that we can see right now that's gonna improve that in the short term. In fact, demand is going up faster than supply and we already have a demand issue. So when I talk to various stakeholders, whether they're academia, industry, anywhere in the Canadian ecosystem, I try and help them find where we see them and how we think they can help us and the country improve. For instance, when I talked to Angela Mandu at Tech Nation, I talked about the fact that this first two years in industry, if we're attracting more talent, we may actually have to up or, or overbuild some of our entry level jobs like help desks, uh, customer support centers, uh, project management offices, the kinds of roles that people take when they first join IT in order for us to build enough talent to graduate into these levels and address the problem. And frankly, this is what every country and every group of countries like the EU are trying to do globally. They're all building their own approaches to helping solve the problem of not enough IT talent. And we think while this is a long-term solution, it's the kind of systemic solution that's gonna make this whole challenge easier to deal with. 
the one thing that's often asked is how do you manage this? Because this is a very diverse set of stakeholders with all different attributes and, and challenges. So we scanned the world to find what we thought would be, and we still believe to be the best way to develop uh, profiles that would be reasonable for all kinds of different jobs in the IT industry. And we selected the skills framework for the information age. So Sophia is a global footprint. It started in UK over 20 years ago, and now it's in 180 countries and translated into 12 languages. I'm gonna give you a lot of detail on it, but it, there's, there's levels of responsibility. And it, it's based on a continuum, if you will, of how people progress in their careers. It starts with knowledge, that which you gain through education or reading a book or taking a course or whatever else you do. It moves up to skill. That's when you have demonstrated that you can apply the knowledge to competence. So that's how you go from level one to level seven in Sophia, knowledge, skill, competence, and you can demonstrate it in different ways across different attributes. Um, what else do I wanna tell you? It's not just an IT framework. So I'm gonna tell you more about that, but it includes what I heard uh, Sander earlier talking about soft skills. And by the way, I really don't like soft skills. My belief is <laughs> that there's nothing soft about the skills that are required to be successful outside of technical ones. So people management, sales management, any kind of management skill, that's not soft at all. In fact, I think it's a transferable skill. So my preference is to talk about technical and transferable skills. The other thing that we found is Sophia is not just for large companies. That's where it originally was created for companies to manage what we talked about earlier. Again, the HR slash IT challenge of how do you designate roles? How do you hire for roles? How do you just manage? the whole idea of skills and competencies across IT. So it's not just a company challenge, it's an individual challenge. We believe that individuals, members of KIPS particularly, can manage their own skill development and professional development plan. Now, not to give you an eye chart, but this is what Sophia looks like, all right? It's 121 skills. It's all across, and I, and I I can't stress this enough. It's not really just about technology. In fact, technology forms a good part of it, but it's got all kinds of other things, right? So relationships, it's got um, how to manage operations, it's got sales, it's got all kinds of attributes. And this, this model, this framework has evolved, as I said, over 20 years. So it's 121, last year was 112. And what you can do with this model is you can characterize whatever you want. Like you can take skill sets and put them together to have a digital transformation model or profile if you want, cybersecurity. So you, because this includes all of the skills required in IT, you can parse it or form any kind of job description you want. So rather than recreating a Canadian only model or a version that's applicable here in Canada, we believe ad adopting an international framework that allows us to create individual ones that we can tune or model or modify for Canadian requirements is a much better model. I think people would accept that IT is not a Canadian talent necessarily exclusive to us. It is absolutely a global industry. And now you don't even know when somebody's talking to you where they reside, they could reside anywhere in the world. And when we're dealing with international people, we think it's more fair to be able to take their attributes, skills, knowledge, all their experience, and put it into a model like this, which is representative of every attribute skill required in IT. So we've chosen to move forward with this to, to help our members understand where they are. I talked about how um, my background includes product and consulting. For me, what this model allows is you to understand the three things that any good consultant works with their clients on. As is, where are you today? To be, where do you want to be? And then the challenge is, how do you get from where you are to where you want to be? So every job that we've, we've got 600 jobs built for profiles perspective, we can tell you every job, what the requirements are for that job. And we can tell you where you are today. So with that in mind, you can absolutely model your own career path. And not only does it tell you 
what levels, but it tells you specifically in any one of the job skills you look at what's required at different levels. So there's no guessing. So when HR people say, well, what does a person at this level four require? It's there. So every one of the 121 attributes, sorry, <laughs> going the wrong way. Every one of the 121 attributes that's listed has its own description that looks like this and seven levels. So there's, again, no guesswork. And the more people that use this model, the more easily people start to understand and accept the fact that, oh yes, you're a level four, you're a level five. You, people start to understand that. <clears throat> and when I mentioned it's used in 180 countries, the more those countries and other countries continue to adopt this, we will be best equipped if we uh, join the group, I guess, and figure out how to make it work for us in Canada. So this is an example. So I heard today from Sandra that the Canadian federal government's looking at developing uh, workforce planning and career paths development activity. So this is what Australian public sector, the entire country of Australia uses Sophia, and the public service has invested hugely. So they've got a, a pathways tool that allows them to look at a, almost every job. 161 jobs have been defined in, in Australia. They've organized them in career paths. They're all defined with Sophia, so there's no guesswork. You can look up any role or definition and see. You can enter your skills and see which roles you map best to. And I'll explain more what we're doing for Canadian members of KIPS right now. But then you can get to link through to all the different positions available throughout the PS. And not only that, all their resources can be searched. So if, they're, if your profile exists in the Australian Public Service System, then they can search and find people when they're looking for employees or people to do work, they can find you. Um, and it's, it says it's in beta, but I'm sure it's advanced past that right now. And if anybody's really interested, I can put you in touch with Grant Nicholson. He's the man who runs the program in Australia, and he's an absolute rock star when it comes to talking about these kinds of capabilities. So how are we taking that and using that with KIPS? So we have taken the SOFIA tool, and we've worked with one of our partners to uh, organize a way to help KIP members, KIPS members assess their own skills. So not only does it give you an assessment of your skills, but it also helps you um, plan what you should be doing next. So what, is, what does it look like? So you log into the system and you have choices about what you want to do, but this is what an assessment looks like. So you come into this tool and you answer a set of questions and the questions are quite extensive and they're skips. If you're not involved in some area, then you don't have to answer questions. You can skip whole sections. So it, it takes about an hour to complete this survey. Once you've completed that survey, you get something like this. This is a report that was generated for one of our employees. So he knows I'm using it. So there's no confidentiality. It's an actual report. So Jonathan went through and completed the survey. And what that allows Jonathan to do is A, he can edit this. So if he, once he gets the report, if he says, hmm, do you know what, I, I think I probably lower or higher, you can go in and edit and create um, a version, a new version immediately. So the tool can be updated immediately. And as we all know, because our uh, work changes our experiences on a regular basis, it should be edited anyway, because as you gain experience on the job, you'll want to make sure that you update your profile. So once this profile is built for KIPS members, what you're able to do is you can map. So you can go into our tool and say, as Jonathan's done here, where are my skills today? So he's uh, put himself down as 100% in the job he currently has, but you can do two, three, two, three, two or three things actually. You can say, okay, here's my profile. Of the 600 jobs we have built, which one is my best fit? And it'll give you a match to two decimal places, i.e., as you can see here, 70.68. So you will get a detailed match where you fit the requirements today and where you have issues. So once that's been done, you can go into skills 
planning or action plan on the top left, and you can look for courses because that's the other thing that we're doing at KIPS. We are taking course catalogs from universities, from private sector employers, from all kinds of different sources, and we're starting to map them back uh, to which skills they will help with from a SOFIA perspective. So you can build an action plan. If you want to be a CIO, as an example, and you need work in a particular area, then you can look for courses and take those courses, complete those courses and update your profile and continue to build your match. So that if you were to approach an employer, as an example, and say, this is the job that I'm applying for, data scientist, as an example, here's my Sophia profile, here's my match to that role, at least from my perspective, and if say it's a 70, 80, 90% fit, anywhere in that range, it's a good conversation to have with an employer. Because of the scarcity and the challenge with hiring qualified people, what we're finding is many employers are willing to take on somebody who's A, motivated, B, mostly trained, C, they can be trained on the job, and having somebody in the seat doing work is better than having nobody. And so, these kinds of assessments and these kinds of conversations are possible with employers today, and they probably never were in the past, or it would have been very difficult to do in the past. So maybe just I'll keep going for a second or two. Oh, no. Thank you. So I'm going to end there and, and hopefully take questions. I've got all kinds of things that I'll include in this deck. So there's contacts. There's a bunch of locations you can go to to find out more information about Sophia. And I would recommend it going to sophiaonline.org. It's an incredible source of information. Uh, the man that put this together is a guy called Ian Seward. He's the head of the foundation, and he's done some amazing work. I'm including more profiles in terms of this is what these things look like and how they can assist you, because you get a really good visual indication of where your skill sets lie. Anyway, maybe I'll stop there. That's a bit quick. I think I rushed through that. But I'm happy if there's any questions, Jen, because what I heard from some people today is that we're trying to build Canadian only solutions. And I'm absolutely convinced that we need to look at this from an international perspective. Mm -hmm. So no, that was, uh, that was really great. Thank you. And yeah, there was a lot to absorb. <laughs> yes, I apologize. Uh, and no, that's fine. And you might, you might want to bounce back to some of those slides, but I, one of the questions raised was, has Sophia, has Sophia been endorsed by the federal government? And has it been piloted or applied in any sort of context or other level of government in Canada? So the short answer is I have approached Treasury Board a couple of times to talk about it. I've approached the Digital Academy. As people talked about earlier, change is really a challenge, right? It's a, it's a challenge to do that. I have tried to broker, and I, I think the right answer is not to talk to me particularly, but to talk to Grant Nicholson in Australia. They have exactly the same challenge, right? They're a federal government that's requiring more IT talent and their approach has been to adopt international standards, to work with international best practices and to help their people understand where they are, i.e. do an assessment and then build career paths or career planning. And what it also allows is you can roll up and roll down. So they were talking today about different departments and trying to understand capacity or capability in different departments. Well, if they're not using the same language, you can't roll up or roll down. You can't compare what the capacity is across respective organizations and or put that in a total bucket for the government of Canada because they're not apples and apples. They're different designations, they're different uh, attributes, there's different all kinds of things. And my argument is you have to use a common standard. You have to speak a common language. And this language, as I talk about, has been updated over the last 20 years and continually updated. And we're a part of the updating process, and so are a lot of other countries in the world. So its relevance or its applicability is much more broad than any one employer or any one country. So, yes, I've talked to them. No, they haven't adopted it. They're so, what's aware. your next step then? Because you know, Treasury Board is the you know central agency, and you know they tried the Universal Classification Standard, which was a uh, you know, a massive, well, I'd say failure, it didn't work. Do you have to go then through CIOs and try and get sort of the take up that way? As So uh, yes, I'm trying to organically grow it. So I'm working with CIO Ken, as you probably know, Phil and Rachel, or so Phil Johnson is the yeah. president and Rachel is the local chapter. So I'm talking to them. Mm -hmm. They're trying to do their own things. I have, candidly, I've offered every CIO in the country 
free membership in KIPS. Every KIPS member gets access to this tool and can do their self-assessment. My hope is by using this tool, they'll start to see how it can help them deal with the issues of the questions I asked. What kind of talent do you have? What kind of talent do you need? And where are your gaps? And what are you doing to deal with them? This capability allows those questions to be answered and, and definitively, not speculatively, not I'm thinking I got this many guys or I got this many guys that are a CS4, so I must have. No, not all CS4s, are not all CS anything are equivalent, right? So you need an individual assessment for every person and every person's plan is likely gonna be different because their career might be different. So it's not an easy task, sorry. No, no, I, I get that. And yeah, you probably start in one department, see if you can grow it, like pilot test it through something like that and see, see how that works. And the one thing I was thinking of was when I was looking at it, having done work around sort of like individual self-assessments generally as an individual you might see yourself as being higher than you are in some areas than others so I was wondering how you built in a, a like a 18360 assessment yep. into that. and I wasn't sure if that was through the endorsement end of it or the um, evidence side of that that whole topic. so um, depending on the circumstance so I mentioned we work with uh, Saskatchewan immigration actually I just said the government but it's immigration we're working with and as you I guess can imagine a lot of people apply and they give CVs or they, so what we're doing with the government of Saskatchewan is having people, because this is all online, complete this survey and they send us their CV and we have people that validate. So we have trained validators. So when you do a self-assessment, so Jennifer goes in and does her self-assessment, we look at your CV and we look at your self-assessment. And curiously, for a lot of Canadians, not so much on the, on the international side, but for a lot of Canadians, they undervalue their work experience. So I look at it and go, no, no, this isn't level three. That's a, clearly a level four or even a level five. So it's interesting to see that. Part of what we do from a KIPS perspective is in the immigration situation in uh, Saskatchewan is we assign mentors. So I, as in my case, I have an individual that I work with. So he's done his self-assessment. I'm giving him advice on... What do you want to do? Where are your skill sets today? And, and does it make sense for you to build that career path and how are you going to get there? And if you need a job in the short term, maybe you take this job and then you build to that because the practical requirements of living and you know su supporting a family. So mentoring is a key part of that. So validating and mentoring. So we'll sometimes coach people to increase their level. Sometimes we'll say, mm, that might be a little bit of an, an uh, exception or an uh, overstatement. But in most cases, as we say with, with Canadians, it's undervaluing their skills, not overvaluing. But we validate. And is it being applied at all in the private sector, are you finding? Yes, it's being- like In Canada? Yes. Yeah. So I, I can't talk about all the different places it's being yeah. applied, but yes, it is being used. And I think as people become more comfortable with it, it's gonna be applied more and more. And especially from our perspective, since we're kind of evangelizing this in Canada, that it's going to get more and more uptake. So we're having a great conversation. In fact, conversations concluded with a large company internationally, and they're making their whole training portfolio available to us. So over 300 technical courses and leadership courses, we're gonna be able to offer to KIPS members free of charge. And the process we're going through right now is mapping those courses back to Sophia attributes. So if Jennifer says, I need a course in, I don't know, it doesn't matter, X, Y, Z, then we'll say there's three courses right? A, B, and C, pick one. They average uh, 40 to 60 hours and they're all online. So you can take, take your own career planning in your own hands and, and advance it. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. What's the cost on that? I, I'm just curious because you mentioned that free okay. membership that you're offering to CIOs. So membership across the country is about, it varies by province because it's a provincial thing. 250 bucks a year, give or take. Yeah. And you get this, you get access to a whole bunch of other benefits, but anyway, I can spend more time or people can just look up membership at kips.ca. Yeah, I'm gonna leave it. Like I have a lot of questions I was talking about. <laughs> but I'm well, wondering, I, I'm gonna open it. I'm gonna just, as I ask another question, open it up to um, participants, uh, viewers, uh, to feel free to ask any question that you, you want in relation to this. 
Um, the, the key question I had was, uh, you know, again, they said that we're talking about the private sector. Are they ahead in developing the, the sort of the, the digital IT skills more broadly? As you talked about in terms of if it's not in your job description, like you're not, you know, we heard that earlier with Sandra, you're not getting access yep. to training. So just wondering, if you, are you seeing a big difference? So we, we do see a difference. When we talk to public sector people, and I do talk to a lot of people um, in the public sector about the challenge, of, especially, again, when I talk about that demand and supply issue with the senior specialists, the public sector people feel challenged competing with private sector. So it feels like for some of them, not all of them, but for some of them, they train people and they really invest in them. And then private sector comes in and scoops them because they pay more money. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I... It's not right or wrong. It's just part of the reality. So again, without a systemic change, that's that's not going to be fixed. We need more talent. But I do think private sector is prepared to invest more and potentially, because there's lots of programs out there, private sector are paying um, for their individual employees to take training. So if you and I sit there and we chat and uh, I say to you, Jennifer, I'd like to take a course, you say, no problem. And we're working with uh, D2L as an example of where they allow employers to pay directly to academia for courses that their employees are taking. So they'll even administer programs of you know, internal training programs mm -hmm. and they'll help deal with third parties to, to get that training uh, delivered. And proof of uh, passing is not necessarily a requirement, but it's, it should be, I think. But yeah. anyway, there's all kinds of things happening out there that private sector are pursuing. The public sector, I think the Canadian Digital Academy will be a, an answer to part of that, um, especially if those certifications or programs that they're offering have uh, recognition or accreditation outside of the government. Perfect. So here's a yeah. question. Are there levels of competencies required by each industry role defined by the member of the association or with the support of some advisory body? So I guess the question, is there an advisory body or is it defined by members of the association? No, it, there is. there are absolutely advisory bodies that create profiles. So yes, when you have a CIO role, for example, there's defined levels you have to achieve. Most, as you could probably imagine, at the highest level. So some roles don't have any requirements for some of the categories. So strategy, not necessarily a requirement for somebody working in a data center, right? Or in a customer service role. And it's absolutely required for a manager or a leader. So when you look at those 121 attributes in the different categories, not all are required clearly for every job. And for certain jobs, you would pick them and you would pick the levels. And yes, uh, some of that's done by the employer too, because they may have choices that they wanna make relative to what skill sets they want. Um, and when we define roles, those are done by groups or committees. Perfect. Okay. Um, what would be your suggestion for the people who are trying to reskill themselves into the IT industry as they apply for jobs? It is not an easy task since many job postings require a certain level of experience and expertise in specific topics. Yes, it's true. So the short answer is, and this is self-serving, but it's true. If you join and, and you get access to a KIPS membership or you become a KIPS member, then you'll get your assessment. And then from that assessment, career planning is, is a genuine possibility and we have free training. The courses I mentioned that we're getting provided to us by different companies and organizations, many of them are free. If they're coming generally from academia like Athabasca University or some other recognized institution, there's sometimes charges associated with them. Um, and you can build your own career path and you can look for training options and alternatives that work for you. So, and if you genuinely are looking for a job here, we can help from a mentoring perspective. So reach out to info at kips.ca. Um, we can talk about membership. We can talk about mentorship, mentoring. We can talk about what your background looks like and where you might be able to move over more easily. So somebody that's coming out of a customer service center in a retail might fit relatively well into a help desk in IT, right? Because you're familiar with all the technology and the operations of a console and recording, all these kinds of things. You just need to be trained on what to do when you get specific issues. So there are paths that can get people from wherever they are to IT, and then they can start to build different paths depending on interests once they're inside the tent, I guess is what I would say. But we can help. So reach out to Kips, reach out to me, um, and I'll figure out 
to do with it. But. Perfect. So KIPS, then you can, I think you said for 250 an individual membership, you get access to the tool as part of the tool. It identifies where you might be lower and in a certain level, and then it attaches here's some options for training to help build up to, to other levels. So sure. excellent, excellent. I think just a resource tool in that regard. What about the mentoring program? Is that part of the membership fee or is that something separate? No, uh, so we provide that as part of the work we're doing with Alberta and for others, and we do it for student members, um, largely just in a group situation. So we'll have myself or anybody. We have lots of different people that will come in and talk to them and answer questions. What do I do here? How do I do this? And so it, when I'm on some of these calls or when I'm um, talking publicly and people reach out and say they, they want to understand more, and I, I send them to info at kips.ca or just find me on LinkedIn and I'll uh, do whatever I can. Hopefully we're not getting a flood, but I'll do whatever I can to help them find right solutions because depending on where they are physically, they'll either be in Ontario, maybe Quebec, or maybe in other province across the country. And that may have a different path than, but as a national CEO, I'll make sure we find a path for them. Perfect. Okay. We have a question. Someone has mentioned they might have missed a part. Is it reinforced that was an excellent presentation. Uh, my question is, is, is Sophia an IT skill tool only? So it's intended to be used by people in IT, but it doesn't just assess IT skills. So you have sales management, product management, all the kinds of skills that you need to be a, in an IT job across any kind of job in IT. And as I'm sure Jennifer knows, and hopefully most people on this call, but people skills and the ability to talk and listen and, and understand what people are asking for are as valuable as technical skills. So it, it assesses all those kinds of things based on your work experience. And so if you're coming from a job that's got no IT in at all, you'll still get some ratings in the SOFIA tool. Yeah, I did notice one and, you know, on, as you were saying, on one of the slides where they had the various, I think, co skills competencies categorized, one was strategy and architecture right there in terms yep. of I think, bringing that more strategic frame to that. Uh, another question we had, what does, what does the implementation of this framework look like in the federal government environment? Or what would you envision it to look like? So uh, it's a long story again, but so Grant, the, the gentleman who created this in Australia, so I, I, I don't know the answer to what would look like in Canada because the, the only example that I know of intimately or know well is the one in Australia. So Grant originally started in the CIO office, very similar to the CIO function in the government of Canada. And he's since moved to what is still called their public service commission. So the view there is this is more about employment and, and jobs than it is about IT. So they've moved the, the requirements or the ownership of this program to the Public Service Commission. And there, the responsibility is exactly what we talked about. For every CS job in different disciplines, can you define categorically and specifically what skills required are to be classified at that level, such that the target's clear. So if somebody wants to get there, they can see what they have to achieve to get there. Or if they're already there, they can get recognition for that or, or, or. But if you think about every role in the government of Canada that's got anything to do with IT, it's an amalgam of those 121 attributes at different levels. And different departments will have different requirements, but they're all gonna have a very consistent view of what the skill sets in total have to look like. So the belief is that it should belong in something like public service commission or in a HR kind of function with, a, with an IT bent to it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the way it's evolved in, in Australia. And I think it's actually the right way to, to go, but. Okay, perfect. I Now I thought I had one more question here, but I don't seem to find it on my list. So if anyone <laughs> posted something and didn't, or not seeing it on there, please, maybe if someone took it off, but please feel free to share it. Um, I think lastly, maybe you just want to talk a bit more about um, maybe just the move, you're trying to shift the terminology or thinking um, away from the term soft skills to something that's more transferable. I was just sort of interested in that because you hear that all the time, the yep. soft skills, which probably doesn't really sell it very well. <laughs> and it's not even true. Like there's yeah. nothing soft about people skills. In fact, 
you and I both know that being able to deal with a difficult situation in a room with people who are, who are upset has significantly more value in my mind, at least, and probably most people's minds, than being able to code something correctly, right? In, the, in a dark room off somewhere, whatever. That's not fair either. But the people that have developed skills, if they're technical, you're pretty much required or confined to an environment. So if you're an SAP person or people, whatever technology you grew up in, that's your niche. If you move from one department that's SAP to another department that's not SAP, those technical skills don't transfer with you. In fact, you have to relearn. If you're a people person, like a project manager or a client rep or some skills where you've spent time and you move from department A to department B, no issue. Like you're gonna be dealing with people in department A, B, C, D, and they're gonna act and behave very consistently. Whereas technology isn't, and even generations of technology. If you worked on one generation and there's a new release, you're gonna have issues there as well. They're not releasing any new types of humans that I'm aware of. So yeah. your skills are transferable. And that's why I much prefer the term transferable than anything else that I've heard so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's perfect. So I think uh, we've reached the end. We're a couple minutes early, but I think that's not bad because we're really jumping from one yeah, to I know. It's, it's back to back, right? There's no time. This gives people a time to, to refresh and uh, grab a drink of water or whatever and then rejoin. So um, Greg, I'd really, really like to thank you for, for taking the time to be with us here today and to share your insights, Greg. And I think, yeah, I would encourage everyone, if you have, um, I don't know if you have a slide with those links, if you want to put it back up. I, well, I don't I'll, think I can, I can right share the deck. Or your, your email, maybe. I can share the deck. Because I thought yeah. the decks are going to be made available. It is going to be shared. I just thought if anybody's really keen, they can yeah. go find it on LinkedIn, right? You said? So yep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Not very complicated name. So no. There's... John, <laughs> <Matt>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. anyway, I looked for you. I couldn't find you. So you're going to have to find me, I think. There's oh, too many my. choices. <laughs> there's way too many John for Smiths. And there's a story behind that. I could have changed it and I didn't. I should have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, who knows? Anyway, anyway, well, thank well, you. Well, thank so you, Jennifer. You made it, you made it a pleasure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we will connect on LinkedIn ourselves and encourage everybody else to as well. So I'll uh, 